Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tatiana Show. Very happy to see everybody here today. Um, we have some changes from our usual lineup. Unfortunately, Josh Shigala is at a conference in Munich right now. I think it's called Bits and Pretzels or something like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he's over in Munich doing a conference, so he's not gonna be joining us today. Crypto Graffiti was supposed to be on with us, and I don't know where he is either, but luckily I have Edward Stringham to keep me company and chat with me a little bit about one of my favorite topics, economics. Now, don't everybody turn the dial right now. Don't start taking a nap because economics is actually quite exciting. And um, so it's the little backstory between how Ed and I met and his controversial position that he had on uh, some crypto, I guess, merging with banks. You know, sometimes I'm a little bit skeptical about are banks going to improve this community? Are they going to detract from some of the more independent aspects that I fell in love with with crypto. Um, but welcome to the show, Edward. I'm really happy to hear you and to see you today. So uh, thank you for joining me. Hello, Tatiana. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yes, very happy to very happy to see you. Where are you coming to me from? You look very official. We're, <laughs> we're here in Hartford at Trinity College. Oh, I didn't know that you were all the way over there. I thought you yeah, were here I mean, in New York City. Well, I'm, 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 I'm all over the world, and here's my office uh, in Connecticut. Okay. Well, you look very, very presidential. Um, <laughs> professorial. <laughs> professorial. <laughs> okay. Sorry. You look professor. <laughs> Yes. Well, actually, so um, you and I, we met each other. We haven't really hung out beyond one evening, but it must have been special. It must have left an impression because here you are. Um, we met at a mutual friend, Maxim Lott from Fox. He has a party every, I don't know, six months or so in New York. And we were chatting and we decided that we should be friends because we both are good friends with Bob Murphy, who unfortunately for you is still my favorite economist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, uh, how did you and Bob meet? Tell me a little bit about yourself for the audience members that don't know you so far. I've known Bob for maybe about, let's see, 16, 17 years. We went to graduate school, uh, not to the same school, but we went to graduate school at the same time. He and I are the same age. I'm just a lot better looking than he is. Uh, so uh, we, we would go to these different conferences at different places, including Mises Institute, a Foundation for Economic Education, and uh, Southern Economics Association. We just ran into each other all the time and then uh, grew a friendship over the years. And I've been trying to uh, hire him at different places, recruiting him at different places where I've been working. And uh, finally, I convinced him to come work at the place that I was working, which was uh, Texas Tech University, and he finally accepted, but I was leaving Texas Tech University that exact year, so um, uh, he started right as I departed, so I never got my wish to get to work with him, but uh, still love that guy. Yeah, well, there's always time. I'm actually going to be seeing Bob and Tom Woods uh, next week, we're taking a cruise. The Contra Krugman cruise has finally <laughs> come. You know, when we first booked it a while back, I thought, oh, it can't come soon enough. But here it is. The time is upon us. We're going to Mexico. Um, I'm sorry that you won't be able to join us, but you said that you're going to be seeing Tom this weekend. You're um, going up to Boston for an event? Yeah, Tom Woods and I are going to be speaking this weekend for the Mises Institute for one of their weekend events. It's going to be held Saturday in uh, out of Cambridge, actually, Harvard uh, University. Okay, so all the smarty pants are getting together to discuss economics. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, what? Tell me a little bit about your backstory. What made you interested in this? Like, what were you like when you were younger? What led you to your path um, to search out liberty and uh, a more equitable society? Well, I was a very good-looking kid when I grew up. <laughs> I yes, you've kidding. mentioned that before. Uh, <laughs> I, could tell. I, I think all the ladies in the audience are swimming right now. Um, I just um, always was interested in business and um, how uh, different people can contribute to society. I don't know why I was interested in that when I was a kid. And in high school, I was also interested in a lot of economic questions for some reason, but I didn't really have a training in any way. I hadn't uh, uh, taken any classes in economics. So Where did you grow up? I'm from Brookline, Massachusetts, which is- Oh, I know uh, Brookline. Yeah, it was great. 
but uh, there were no economics classes, and so I was kind of without guidance. Um, but going to college, my lovely mother, whom I love so much, told me that I should major in economics because I will love it. And sure enough, she was right. And uh, it's just been amazing to see all these people study the world. And I uh, took some classes, some mainstream economics classes, and uh, those were good. Um, but I had another professor my second year named Professor Nicholas Sanchez, and he, he said, hey, uh, everything you studied in your previous class in, in macroeconomics, it's all wrong. And I was like, oh, intriguing. So there's this debate going on here. And in that class, we started reading some different ideas about how government should manage the economy. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then moving on, I had my favorite professor as an undergraduate. It is named Professor Walter Block. And I just loved him. He got me so excited. He was engaging. He would present different perspectives and present things in a way to debate and to just get students to see that this is a very lively topic. I think there's so many economists just like blah, 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 blah. They're so boring. And I'll always remember Walter Block, just uh, inspiring to me and other students. There's a few of us now who are college professors because of, of that. Um, yes, I'm, I've actually enjoyed his lectures. He, he oftentimes takes a uh, controversial position. No, that, I think you must be talking about another Walter Block. <laughs> I remember we were at the uh, Ron Paul rally in Tampa in 2012, and this was one of the first times I'd really listened to him do a speech, and he did it about abortion. And it was in the middle of the Ron Paul thing. And, I mean, it was a very interesting um, talk, but just seemed really out of place. <laughs> and it just that's, everybody that's, mad. It's like you might as well uh, talk about Israel and Palestine. <laughs> you know, throw some gasoline on the fire. It was really... He, he is a, he's, a, he's that type of person. So I could, very, uh, I could question why he would do that as well. Um, but as, a, as, a, as an undergraduate, he just... I had the good fortune of him, seeing him, you know, twice a week, every week. And I had the good fortune of taking... Um, I think it was three classes, perhaps four classes with them, and it was just amazing to see uh, him presenting all these different ideas every week, and, and I, I, I really will always appreciate that. Uh, but you are right, he, he, he is the author of a book called Defending the Undefendable, and uh, it's almost like he just enjoys staking out these very controversial positions. Well, they're obviously very well thought out and, and very compelling. I, I haven't made my decision yet. Uh, I actually should check out that book. Um, but, you know, when you said about economics being boring versus an engaging teacher, in high school I didn't think that economics was interesting. In fact, now that I think about it, I don't think that they really addressed it particularly. There was social studies, which was really boring. And I remember thinking to myself when I saw the movie The Money Masters, Bill Still's movie, and thinking – they could just wipe out an entire grade if we just showed this, <laughs> um, this one film. And when I went on to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, that was my first economics class because I took uh, international music business. Oh, wow. And the teacher there, he was an Argentinian gentleman and he introduced us to The Economist. And at first I thought, why am I gonna read this? This looks terrible. But I wow. thought that it really helped merge a lot of my ideals with more real world kind of examples and manifestations of of theories to see you know things would actually work out a lot of times i think that um there's some clash with liberal people because of their lack of understanding of economics maybe they've only been taught that kind of generic Keynesian economics that everybody else is taught. Or, or even no economics, even worse. Right. Yes. And and so they think we'll just give, you know, raise the raise the money, give money to the poor, and they don't understand the repercussions. Subsequently I recently created a Bitcoin, I'm sorry, an economics one oh one with Bob. So Oh great. I hope that people watch it and, and get something out of it. Um I can't wait to check it out. Yes, I know that you just wrote a book in the effort to help spread the word. So tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> it's Very called nice. uh, Private Governance. It just came out with Oxford University Press. 
It's basically about the history of, of markets and how markets are underpinned by private rules and regulations. So basically everybody assumes government makes markets possible. Government needs to enforce contracts, uh, prevent predation. Otherwise, you're not going to see advanced exchange. I go, go through history historically and show through time and time again, I found it's kind of fascinating. The most advanced markets were made possible by private rules and regulations. So it's not a theoretical thing. It's not an abstract thing. But as a practical matter, you look at places like the world's first stock exchanges, 17th century Amsterdam, 18th century London, uh, 19th century New York, they're all made possible because of private rules and regulations. So in London, they traded in a coffee house to create and enforce rules. So this whole idea that government is created to create markets, or you need government rules and regulations to advance markets, that's just not the case. And then I bring it forward to today with things like electronic commerce. It's underpinned by financial intermediaries such as PayPal or credit card networks, payment processors. Uh, I know you're also interested in uh, uh, cri cryptocurrencies and blockchain, which I've started to get really into. These, these companies, or, or lack of companies in some of these cryptocurrencies, are actually facilitating exchange in ways that government officials are not interested in doing. Yes, I would say so. Um, but of course, the the easy question is going to say, well, how do the rich guys, you know, make sure that they don't rig it? Which the counter would be, they're already doing it now. But you know, how do you create an equitable market without government regulation? What if people can't be trusted to self-regulate? Well, the, the cool thing, if you look at, for example, the New York Stock Exchange, it really opened up um, fi equity finance to the common person, which was in, in America, which was not, uh, you couldn't do that before uh, stock markets. Before you had to be a rich person, you had your own company, or before that, maybe if you invested in a large company, but New York, you saw this huge proliferation of companies, and they could raise money from anybody in society. So it's basically a common man's capitalism. And now that's great. Everybody can get rich to varying degrees. Everybody can participate in um, owning a company, even if you own just one thousandth of the company in, the, in your shares. Uh, but at the same time, you've got uh, people with fraudulent schemes then and now. And what the New York Stock Exchange did was they came along and they said, hey, you can trade over there, go you know, do whatever you want, but if a, if a company's gonna be listed in the New York Stock Exchange, they've gotta to adhere to our rules. They've gotta have accounting uh, disclosure. They've gotta have all types of rules about how many shares they have, if they're gonna issue new shares. So basically providing assurances to the little person, that's one of the most underappreciated things about the New York Stock Exchange, about finance in general. Hmm. I don't know. I think this stuff might be a little bit uh, complicated. Yeah. What about Blythe Masters? <laughs> so sorry to just randomly drop yeah, this off so here. So this is something that um, you know, Blythe Masters credit default swap fame, you know didn't go so well, but you were making the counter. And I'm undecided on this. I think that she's probably a very intelligent woman. She's very forward thinking. She's obviously quite talented. But there was a little bit of a question mark in my mind and some other people's mind about engaging with somebody who created something that ended up resulting um, in a big problem for society. Yeah, and so you took a very contrarian position. Yeah, and you, to and be fair, just, you and I disagree on this question. So well, you're more educated on this. I still <laughs> might disagree with you, but I would maybe place my bets on you anyway. So give me a little background as to as to how you view that. Yeah, so my research looks at historical markets like you know, 19th century New York, also looks at modern markets. And for those viewers who don't know who Blythe Masters is, she is very interested in blockchain technology today. Before that, she worked for JP Morgan, and she's credited with inventing 
the credit default swap, which is basically insurance on mortgages in case things go bad. And um, uh, I think that credit default swaps themselves were a great invention. So in the same way that uh, just because you invent insurance product, it's, an, it's not technically insurance, but it's like insurance, just because you invent insurance product, it doesn't mean that you're never going to have to have payouts. It also doesn't mean that everybody who sells insurance is going to do it properly. So in that respect, if somebody invented health insurance or life insurance, I think we should be celebrating that person as a great hero. Now, it was the case some of these insurers um, didn't price their products properly, and they went broke. Uh, however, most of them actually got paid. So even when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got um, nationalized, that was considered a, a credit event, and people were like, what are we going to do? Most of those products got paid. So uh, it was a case that certain people lost. But to blame insurance, the equivalent of insurance, to blame something which is just manifesting problems, is showing up in that market for causing the problems, I think it was a much bigger issue, things like government mismanagement of the economy, government uh, uh, regulation of uh, uh, banking, such that uh, certain people were forced to get loans, they later defaulted on those loans, and then we say, oh, see markets, Wall Street created it. Totally disagree with that whole perspective. So I think that that she's uh, uh, she's great in that issue. And now I want to talk about what she's doing uh, now and talk about how great she is. I, by the way, I've never met her and, and not paid to uh, support her. I just think she's genius. Uh, what she's doing now is she's taking the blockchain technology out of Bitcoin and using it for mainstream financial intermediation. And so a lot of my friends are like, oh, no, no, you need to have Bitcoin. It needs to be the cryptocurrency. And I'm a fan of that too. Great, fine, good luck. Uh, but I think it's fascinating when large companies like JP Morgan and other groups, uh, NASDAQ is using this on small scale uh, issues to say, hey, look, there's this technology which was created by uh, some mysterious libertarians that we don't even know who they are, but it's so cool that we're actually going to be able to use this for mainstream financial intermediation. I think it's awesome, and it just shows how uh, whoever the contributor, the, the business world is just looking at ways to, to uh, make things run more smoothly. So I think there's a lot of potential for uh, maybe anonymous cryptocurrencies, but also using crypt, um, technology from cryptocurrencies, specifically blockchain for mainstream financial companies as well. Uh, I think that you bring up a lot of fair points. You make a good case for it. I um, was listening this morning to Andreas Antonopoulos. Have you ever heard him speak? No. He's um, you know, one of my absolute favorite Bitcoin speakers, and he just appeared on Joe Rogan. I believe it was his third appearance promoting his book, The Internet of Money, that he just put out on Amazon. And one of the things that he was talking about was Joe Rogan asks him, well, what happens you know, if the banks, they just have their own currency? And when he um, illustrated the advantages of doing it individually versus doing something that has so much permission, uh, built into it as if it had been coming through a more traditional um, financial services provider. It was an interesting conclusion that he came up with, but uh, there's obviously a lot of incentive for financial institutions to get involved with uh, blockchain technology as well as Bitcoin. And there's been a lot of money going into supporting that. I think sometimes you know, people do like that transparency, but I think as long as there's more options and there's more competition, uh, the market can, to a certain extent, decide unless uh, things become more and more meddled with by the government, uh, yeah. which I guess there's some, you know, from the government's perspective, I think that they, it makes sense for them to want to regulate. Yeah, <laughs> they need so, to get their money. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Friedrich Hayek has this famous thing on denationalization of money from the 70s. and. When most people read that, including me for the first time, it's like, ah, oh, this sounds like science fiction. But we're actually kind of going towards that stage where 
you can have competing side by side these different currencies, and you know um, whether uh, you know it's Bitcoin or something else ultimately wins or loses. I think it's just going to open up so many different options, and uh, you might be able to use certain aspects of it some places, other aspects of it other places. I think that uh, one of the most interesting things, whether it's conducted, these contracts are conducted in dollars or a cryptocurrency, but things like smart contracts, algorithmically enforced smart contracts, whatever the currency, I think this is huge potential for enabling markets to enforce contracts, not having to rely on government courts, not even having to rely on private uh, courts, you've got basically the ability to have these algorithms programmed in that says, you know, we've got this bet. Whoever wins the bet, the algorithm's going to say uh, Ed Stringham has to pay Tatiana the money, and it's already programmed into my wallet um, through the blockchain, and nobody can back out of it. We just we don't need a bookie anymore. We don't need a uh, uh, anybody to enforce this contract. It's done using an algorithm. The most important person to cut out is your bookie because you know, <laughs> you've just been handing money over to him for years now and you're sick of it. I know. <laughs> um, are you familiar with Pamela Morgan? This is much more your space. I'm more into the uh, more uh, mainstream stuff, so you have to tell me who all these people are. Well, in the interest of, of um, you know, helping, I, I think that this show focuses a little bit more on people that aren't necessarily in crypto and it's such a key thing when you're learning about a new technology to have the right teacher and when you talk about the exciting possibilities of blockchain and law i immediately think of pamela morgan uh, of empowered law she's also the ceo of third key solutions and she really has um a lot of interesting things going on in terms of coming up with different ways of uh, establishing juries uh, and administering justice next week the ross ulbricht appeal is happening so I'm going to be going to the courthouse which is obviously really intense and when you think about that trial when they source the different jury members it was all government employees and most of them were over 40 so for them to give an educated decision about the future of a young man's life when they don't know anything about the technology that really has a lot of you know implications for the for the trial itself because of um, Fourth Amendment issues you know were they allowed to seize the server were they not there are a lot of and also deciding whether the government told a true story so the fact that the jury didn't understand the technology was a distinct disadvantage to the defendant and um, so I'm really excited to see some of the progress there. I would highly recommend it. I'll send you some links after our after our chat what is it that you you're also a professor what are you exactly teaching? What, what's that experience like? And do you do different speaking engagements? Tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, teach economics. I teach also uh, in our minor here called formal organizations. And so I teach different classes, alternative economic systems, comparing different ways of doing things. And uh, it's just fantastic. I love interacting with our students. They love interacting with me. I got um, 3.9 out of 4.0 teaching evaluations here. So uh, the feeling is mutual. I'm also invited to give talks all over. I gave 24 uh, talks last year around the country and the world. So uh, to me, it's just a great thing interacting with lots of kids and then also different people on these speaking engagements. And then at the same time doing research, uh, just getting out there and, and finding new information that people hadn't analyzed, people missed before. Uh, last uh, 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 summer, uh, this recent summer, I just wrote this article, which I think I sent you actually, on uh, is America facing a police crisis? I think that uh, research like this is just so important. You've got a lot of emotional discussions out there about everything, and some people say, oh, well, you know, police have to be doing good. They're, they're always on the side of good. We, it's just like an assumption. Well, as a professor, I can actually go do the research, see what's going on, and uh, write about it. So to me, it's, it's just a fantastic opportunity to help shed light on things that most people just assume is or is not true.
Can you share a little bit about what you did um, write about in that article? Because a lot of the audience is actually quite interested in, in that type of thing. So, I mean, we're coming up on the uh, closer to the end of the show, but we have a little bit of time. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, so uh, Wall Street Journal asked me to write this. It's actually nearly two full pages and basically a review of four books. Some of the books are, one of them is uh, by this lady named Heather McDonald's where to her the police can do no wrong. The police are under assault. They're increasingly being killed and they're not really killing many people. And some of the things I did, I just looked at the data and it's actually kind of shocking Last year, 41 police officers were slain in the line of duty, and that means their victimization rate, their homicide victimization rate, is 4.6 per 100,000, and the average American's homicide victimization rate is 4.5 per 100,000, so basically exactly the same. So it's basically as safe uh, to be a police officer as an average American citizen, just as just looking at homicide victimization rate. At the same time, police killed uh, one out of 12 people who got killed last year by violent death are killed at the hands of police. So this is not a small number we're talking about. They represent one out of 360 of the population and they're killing one out of 12 people, which I think is just out of control. I mean, it's really, really shocking. I read the article when you sent it to me, and as I go forward, I think I got to quote some of these statistics because that's outrageous. Did you, I mean, what were what was people's reaction to this, and did you find that there were any kind of divisions along racial lines? Obviously, right now there's a lot of controversy about Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, some people support the idea. Some people don't necessarily like the idea that it's really focused along racial lines. Did you find in your research that there was anything, uh, like, can you speak to the race issue when, when talking about police brutality? Uh, so uh, definitely the police kill um, uh, both uh, racial groups, the majority, of the most people who are uh, killed by police are whites. Uh, on the other hand, a disproportionately high number of the, the people who are killed are African Americans. So there is that difference. Um, but one of the main things that, that I saw in uh, reading up on this article, there's this book called uh, To Serve and Protect by Norm Stamper, who's a former policeman. And he just went through and talked about his experience and he said that police forces are breeding grounds for racism and they use their power to uh, extract resources from people, often people who can't protect themselves, especially through the legal system. It's, it's like the, the police, the courts, the prosecutors, everybody works together. So this idea that we've got this somehow uh, unbiased judge who's going to weigh the evidence. It's just not the case. And so in many cases, they just railroad people. Uh, also in my research, there's another book called A Good Month for, for Murder by Del Quentin Wilbur. And he's trying to portray the police in a good light. Well, oh, look, you know, good guys versus bad guys. And he describes them, what they're doing, interrogating people uh, without... Uh, um, uh, a lawyer present, keeping them up throughout the middle of the night, throwing chairs against the walls to intimidate them, uh, looking through all of their text messages, all of their cell phone things, going to the police, I'm uh, sorry, to the judges. There's this one quote where it says, uh, can I have a warrant on this guy? And the judge says, yeah, okay, here you go. And then the judge says, what's it for? Wink. And it's like, this just goes against all you know, alleged legal principles which the police are supposed to follow, uh, they're really kind of just lawless and uh, it's, it's quite, quite frightening. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I've learned a lot of different statistics. I've gone to visit Ross in the prison and of course that sort of sparked a lot of interest and a lot of sympathy for the people there. Seeing all these different children crawling all over their daddies, hearing the moms talk to each other. One of the stories that I heard one of them say was, you know, before my husband went to jail, incidentally for a nonviolent crime, 
uh, our children were doing well. They were getting straight A's in school. They were bright. They were happy. And now they're getting D's and F's. And the ripple effects throughout the communities are absolutely, basically, you can't even account for all of that damage that you're doing uh, that ripples through generations. And the the people in the poor neighborhoods are really tax slaves. And not only are they tax slaves in a regular way, but all of these stupid tickets that they give people, they just yeah. are basically extorting money from them. And then on the trial side, 95% of people take a plea deal yeah. because they don't even go to trial because 95% of trials are, are in the favor of the government. So this illusion that's promoted on television and these stupid BS stories we hear about, um, it's basically propaganda is really yeah. inaccurate when you look at the numbers. So I really think that your research on that topic is um, very compelling and uh, important to get out there. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's tremendously destabilizing on whoever gets caught up in this dragnet. And it's especially problematic in some of these cities like Ferguson, uh, Missouri. If you want to read some you know, sad stuff, read the, the government's report on policing there where they routinely would just target people to raise revenue. The, the uh, uh, tax collector would say to the police, hey, you know, we're, we're facing a budget deficit this year. Is there anything you guys can do to ramp up the number of tickets and, and arrests? And, and, and they, they would do it. And they, they'd say, yeah, sure, we'll see what we can do. So giving like arrest warrants for people who have an overgrown lawn, for example. It's very interesting that a lot of conservatives are are skeptical about government and say, oh, you know, you know, we don't want them messing with us. But at the same time, giving these union officials, un unaccountable union officials, the ability to collect taxes, that's not what they're supposed to be there for, even according to the mainstream conservative perspective. But then it's like somehow what they're doing is, um, you know, it's okay, it's completely justified. So there's this weird disconnect that you see. I, I'm gonna forget the statistic, but it's something like uh, in a town of 20,000 people, there were like 9,000 uh, arrest warrants issued in, in Ferguson, something crazy like that. Yeah, and, I remember that. And uh, it's, it's, it's not just the case in Ferguson. In uh, Norm Stamper's book, he, he said that when he started out his job, as a beat cop, with it, within months he quickly realized that he and his colleagues were being uh, rewarded for uh, arrests, tickets, and field interrogations. And they basically had these informal quotas so they could show that they're doing a good job. And it's totally different from business. Business makes money by pleasing the customer, whereas with police it's like, oh, let me just show my boss how many people I arrested, and uh, he says in there, he says, it, within, within weeks, he it, it found out that the uh, lives and the well-beings of the people on his police beat were irrelevant. So I think this is something that's very important that uh, uh, people across the political perspective uh, spectrum should be caring about, whether it's a liberal or a conservative. Conservatives are, they don't want government interfering in their lives, allegedly, but in the most fundamental sense, like letting people uh, uh, pull over people without any suspicion and basically messing up uh, their lives for a nonviolent offense, I think it's just crazy. I mean, it's it's really a question of, I thought that, you know, these were people paid through our tax dollars, so therefore they should be serving us, but the incentives have been completely perverted. Um, before Especially the, with, oh, go ahead, I'll just mention quickly, um, uh, uh, asset forfeiture, we're at the point where police don't even need to petition a judge to seize assets. It's now very difficult to get that back, and there's now more government asset for, for forfeiture, just in terms of dollars, than the total amount of private burglaries per year. I'm sorry, I'm not saying anything to the people that are listening. They're, they must be wondering if I disappeared, but that is astounding. It really brings home the story of Robin Hood. 
um, you know, Robin Hood is, is oftentimes portrayed as stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, which as a capitalist, I'm like, wait a second, hold on, who's stealing my stuff? But in a way, another person recently framed it that Robin Hood was stealing from the government to give it back to the people from whom it stole it in the first place. <laughs> so um, now, what do you think about private security and police um, services? Because when I engage with people and I talk to them about anarchy or libertarianism or minimizing government, we talk about privatization a lot. And people have some concerns that, oh, well, all the rich people will get all the good services and somebody wouldn't. Have you given any thought to something like that? What would the world look like if government wasn't in the business of policing um, the people? Yeah, so if you look at the private groups that serve lower income people like uh, Walmart or McDonald's those they're not compelling anybody they're not you know they're not providing uh, Ritz Carlton style service but they're providing lots of goods and services at a low cost that people want to keep going back and poor people don't have the ability to say to police I'm sorry that we don't want to have this and so one of the founders of Black Lives Matter she's now saying we should be allowed to have police free zones. And I think that's an attractive alternative. If that's what they're asking for, then that's something that should be considered allowing private alternatives. There are, are certain people who believe it's restorative justice within the Black Lives Matter community, eliminating some of these um, uh, criminal sanctions, the, the, the system that is stacked against them. So I think if anything, uh, we should be listening to them. The government is not on the side of uh, poor people in this case. It's not on the side of African American, uh, African Americans in this case. And so I, I would say, yeah, turn it over the hands of private people actually care about their customers who don't have incentive to abuse their customers. I think it'd be a much better alternative. It could be done in a neighborhood level. It could be done in a housing community. So maybe just let, um, and that's what rich people already have. Harvard and MIT already have fully deputized private police. So I say if it's good enough for Harvard and MIT, why can't these lower income communities try the same things for themselves? Well, I think that the question is always, oh, can people be trusted to govern themselves, which I, of course, believe that they can. But I think that there's a little bit of a, you know, I think people have a little a little ways to go before they can start accepting those kinds of ideas. But what you're proposing seems very reasonable. Um, you know, I didn't realize that these are some of the solutions being proposed in that community. And I think that anything that can be done to raise awareness for these brutality issues and for this injustice is really important and also having those solutions. Um, do you have any other things that you wanted to talk about today? And maybe you could tell people where they can catch up with you get your perspective on, on other economic topics and, and the such. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. So if you want to follow my more superficial stuff, it can be on Twitter. It's Ed Stringham. Uh, and then if you want to look at my more uh, academic stuff, all my art academic articles are on SSRN.com. Or if you want to check out my my books, they're all available on, on uh, Amazon. I've got obviously private governance. Get that. Get to, <laughs> um, but you also it's might have seen. Gift. Yeah, uh, this is an even better one. But you also might have seen my book, Anarchy and the Law, which is uh, an edited volume, and uh, uh, those are also available on uh, Amazon as well. So thanks. Excellent. Very cool. Well, I, this was really very enjoyable. Um, I hope the audience felt like it was as well. We went a little bit over because I was. This is some juicy stuff. So we'll have to have you back on. Uh, in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, right before we go, we usually do something. We, we're broadcast on LRN.FM, Liberty.me, which is our hosting station, IPM Nation, and also Let's Talk Bitcoin. And we usually have a magic word or a magic phrase. It can't be something, you know, buy my book. But do you have, <laughs> do you have a phrase that you would want to um, impart to everyone to use as the magic word or words? This one might be too complicated, but how about Hayekian anarchism? You know what? Okay, Hayekian anarchism, and we, we spell that for everybody. So Friedrich Hayek, H A 
Y E K, so Hayekian, uh, I A N, mm -hmm. then anarchism. All right, fine. I check like it. it. Out. I've written about it. People can check that out. I like that. I like that phrase. I wanted to make sure that we um, said thank you to all of our sponsors. We're going to let Ed jump off here. Uh, we Thanks. have. La BitConf um, going down to Buenos Aires. I should probably give you guys updates on all my stuff anyway, since we're here together, just us today. Um, so I have the Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Buenos Aires. I have the Steemit Festival um, in Amsterdam, which is November 11th. The La BitConf is the November 4th and 5th. Um, then I'll be doing a little short tour that I am almost confirmed for. Uh, so please check out those things on TatianaRose.com. Make sure that you support our sponsors who have been so kind. Uh, the Bitcoin CPA, they are my heroes. I say this every single time and I mean it every single time because doing your taxes with Bitcoin is a lot harder at this point. Uh, I know in a couple of years it'll be super easy. Now it's still a little tricky and uh, they're wonderful over there. Um, they've got some video courses as well that you can watch. Uh, CryptoCompare.com. Find out all your information about all the different cryptocurrencies out there. Compare prices. Uh, Valtoro, uh, Josh, our co-host, he just integrated with them. So that's exciting. Uh, please support FreeRoss.org because um, obviously it's really important to raise awareness about the harms of the drug war and also the, the questions to our freedoms that are kind of being brought up with this case that it has been just really, really corrupt, to be honest. Uh, there's a free Ross um, Amazon link. So if you go to freeross.org and you buy things from Amazon, say you don't have any money, you don't want to donate, but you buy crap on Amazon all day like I do, click on it and you'll be there. Uh, thank you everyone, tatianamrose.com, cryptomediahub.com if you have any marketing, PR, or advertising questions for the space. And keep an eye out for my new record, I swear it's coming out. It's so awesome. We're working really hard on putting it together. So keep an eye out and sign up for our newsletter if you want to find out more. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our hosts. And we'll see you next week.